today I'm going to talk about the legend of the Golden Jesus. Uh, it's also the story of a pioneer missionary by the name of Llewellyn Harris. This is probably the first treasure story that I ever heard as a young boy. And this story starts all the way back in 1979. I was raised LDS, which is sometimes better known as the Mormons. They've kind of steered away from using that term. It's too many groups have used it as a derogatory term. But it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And in this religion, we have what's called home teachers. And these home teachers go around to the different members of the ward, ward area and they look in on the families and make sure they're doing okay, their needs are being met, and everybody's um, healthy and happy and, and doing fine. And it, it's a good program. The home teaching program has changed quite a bit over the years. But I do remember, I have some fond memories of the old timers that came to our home as home teachers and some of the thoughts and stories they shared with us. And one of these stories was about the um, treasure story of the Golden Jesus. And um, this old man, whose name was Leo Wilson, he would have been about 78 years old in 1979. And he grew up in Escalante and was a, a farmer and a cattleman. And he ran sheep and cattle out on what's known as the known locally as the 50 Mile Mountain. Uh, the name of the mountain is the Kaparowitz Plateau, if you look on a modern map. But it's called the 50 Mile Mountain by local people, local residents, because the mountain range is approximately 50 miles long from one end of the plateau to the other. And <clears throat> this is a very remote and mysterious area. I've spent quite a bit of time on the plateau over the years. Um, my father and I, in 1985, found a survey note left by John Wesley Powell Expedition in 1875. We found that capsule in a pile of rocks on the north end of the plateau near Escalante. And I might spend a little time sometime and tell about that experience and about that survey note and a little bit about the John Wesley Powell expedition. But for now I want to focus on the story of Llewellyn Harris and this Golden Jesus treasure. Um, <clears throat> Llewellyn Harris was called to be a missionary by Brigham Young about the same time that um, Jacob Hamlin the well-known Mormon missionary to the Indians and he was called in that same general conference to be a missionary to the Indians. Um, Llewellyn Harris was born and raised, they're born in Wales, over in Wales and he immigrated with his mother when he was a young boy by ship and came to America. Shortly after he arrived his mother passed away, died, and he was left an orphan on the streets of New York. And he learned to survive, um, how, to, how to make a living, and he eventually migrated to the West and came, came West with the Mormon pioneers. He spent two years with the Indians and um, learn to love and respect the native peoples. When he was called on a mission to the Indians, he wrote a letter to Brigham Young and told Brigham Young that these people had a had some Welsh words in their language. And one of the things that Llewellyn Harris had always been taught by his mother was that he was a descendant from the Welsh kings and princes, and one of these was Madoc, Prince Madoc. And 
I'll talk a little more about Prince Maddock in my interview with Dan Lowe. And we discussed quite a bit about that history. But right now I just want to tell about the what Leo Wilson told me and my family about Llewellyn Harris when he came to Escalante. And he came to Escalante, I believe, in about 1879. And he brought with him some cattle and his family, of course. And he immediately went out onto the Kaparowitz Plateau and started running cattle out there. And everybody always wondered how Llewellyn Harris knew about this area, this remote area, as a good place to raise cattle. Because at that time, nobody, none of the pioneers were, were out in that area. But as time went on, part of the story started to come out that Llewellyn Harris had been on a mission among the Indian people in the Southwest, the Zuni people particularly. And while he was there, the, the people were dying from smallpox. And as they were dying from smallpox, Llewellyn Harris happened to show up on the scene and he gave them blessings and and, and, and he healed them just like Jesus healed the, the sick and the diseased in his time. Jesus said that the follower, his followers, his true followers and those that had his authority would be able to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And Llewellyn Harris gave blessings to all of these individuals in this village and they were all healed except for a minister and a medicine man who was working against him, they were the only ones that died. They were the ones that refused his blessing. Because of their gratitude for this great miracle, these people gave Llewellyn Harris a gift, and the gift was a map. Now the map, I do not know whether this map was made by the Zunis, or if it was a Spanish map, but I suspect it was a Spanish map, because the treasure that this map referred to, or showed where the location of, was a Spanish treasure. And the Zuni people had told Llewellyn that this Spanish, the Spanish had enslaved them and made them work in their mines, and that because of this they felt like this treasure was cursed, and that it should not be used by anyone for bad purposes. But because they had such great respect for Llewellyn Harris, they felt like he would use it for a good purpose. And so they gave him this map, and it was on a piece of buckskin. Llewellyn Harris took this map and he sewed it to the inside of his coat that he always wore. And later, through subsequent research, I learned about him sewing this map into the liner of his coat that he always wore. Later, as I did research, I came across um, the story of the Golden Jesus as told by George A. Thompson in his book, Lost Treasures of the Old Spanish Trail. Now, I'm actually going to read that article. I'd like to give George Thompson some credit for this article, if I can find it. I should have had this all marked, but I've been to it so many times. On page 74 of George A. Thompson's book, Lost Treasures on the Old Spanish Trail, he says, One of the first treasure legends given birth by the Mexican Revolution was born only a few months after the overthrow of the Spanish began. A strange tale is told of an even stranger treasure buried in a shallow cave near the north end of the Caparowitz Plateau close to the little town of Escalante in Garfield County, Utah. With the revolution that began in 1810, Indians aided by a few sympathetic mestizos joined to set fire to a mission and drive its padre and soldier guards from the land. The padre had been a mine owner whose mission had acquired great wealth and expense at the expense of many Indian lives. With his few soldiers to assist him, he loaded 20 burrows with gold artifacts from the mission 
and silver bullion from his mine. They fled north to avoid the Apaches who were raiding Spanish settlements to the south. From the mine, according to some, located near the Virgin River Gorge, they followed the north side of the Colorado River, hoping to reach the old Spanish trail and escape along it to Santa Fe. That would be the crossing of the fathers, which is um, now covered by present-day Lake Powell. Their pursuers were persistent, however, and every day saw several of their heavily laden burrows fall to exhaustion or another soldier killed by Indians who pursued them. When they reached the north end of the Caparos Plateau, known locally as the 50 Mile Mountain, they realized they could never hope to cross the waterless desert which lay ahead without being caught and all of them killed. With the threat of death very real, the Padre and his last two soldiers decided that their only chance was to cache their heavy treasure. In a shallow cave in the black Malpais rock, they hid the heavy bars of bullion and all of the church treasure, including the golden Jesus, a three-foot-high cross of solid gold bearing a figure of the crucified Christ on it. The cross was so heavy that it took all three of them to lift it. After all of their treasure was hidden, the small cave was covered over with pieces of stone. All expected that one day they would return, but unknown to them, the land would never be under Spanish control again. The legend of the Golden Jesus might be treated as just another treasure tale, except for what happened 60 years later. By the 1870s, Mormon pioneers had settled much of southern Utah, and many had heard Indians tell of the running fight so long before. They heard strange tales of a cave in the mountains from which the Indians sometimes brought Catholic crosses, golden chains, and silver goblets to trade for food. Bishop Llewellyn Harris had been especially kind to the impoverished Indians, and in return for his kindness, one of them told him how to find the cave. But in those hard days of settling the desert, Bishop Harris had no time to explore the rugged 50-mile mountain, so several years passed before he made any search. He never found the cave of the Golden Jesus, but he did find the bones of burrows and the frames of pack saddles, and atop the plateau he found an old Spanish spur and part of a broken sword. Even today, an occasional hunter or cowboy finds an ancient-looking hand-forged mule shoe or the brass button from a soldier's uniform. If you should stop while at Escalante, almost anyone can point out the trail to the 50-mile mountain, and there are still a few old-timers who remember the tale of the Golden Jesus. Well, in my subsequent research, I have found that some of the things in this story are true, and some of them are pretty fanciful. Um, I was able to establish that some burrow bones and pack saddles were found on top of Grand Bench, which is below the 50 Mile Mountain, and, above, and also above the Crossing of the Fathers. Uh, Har Harvey C. Bailey, who was the brother-in-law to, to Llewellyn Harris, he married, I believe he married Llewellyn Harris's daughter. And Harvey C. Bailey is the one that found the burrow bones and the pack saddles. Llewellyn's Har Llewellyn Harris's name is on many areas in the Escalante and uh, Glen Canyon. Uh, Grand Canyon area. There's uh, Llewellyn Canyon, there's Harris Wash. Um, his name is on inscribed in several locations on the 50 mile mountain. And we do know that he came from his mission to Escalante from one of his Indian missions. He moved to Escalante and went directly to the 50 mile mountain and started raising cattle. From the Escalante story, we read on page 387, um, Peter Schertz and Llewellyn Harris were longtime missionaries and envoys to the Indians 
and probably influenced them to treat the settlers fairly. It was his Navajo friends that showed the well and Harris the trail up the southeast end of the Kaparowitz, and thus opened the range on top of the 50 mile mountain to white men. And obviously that's to cattle, to cattle ranching. The Navajos are said to have told Harris about a buried gold Jesus that led to the, perpetual, the perpetuation of a legend of buried treasure somewhere on the mountain. And and to some fruitless search for the gold Jesus. Navajos made an annual pilgrimage to the plateau for a winter's supply of venison. Their drying and smoking racks can be seen several places on the plateau. I've got a an, another reference here in a in a Utah history book, a historical book about Utah. Um, this talks about sil the Silver Reef, and I'm gonna we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. But I do believe that Silver Reef, that Silver Formation, is the actual location that the silver, the mine, and the mission that was associated with this treasure were located. In this historical book, it says various men have been credited with this discovery of silver at Silver Reef. Some old-timers maintain that the Spaniards once mined ore here, pointing to the old Spanish map brought in by Llewellyn Harris in the 1850s. And I can add to that that near this area now we have evidence of Spanish inscriptions and carvings in the sandstone near that area of the mine. From the, from the book A Village in Zion's Shadow, uh, this writer talks about Albert at his curio store in Rockville. said, I found Albert in his curio store surrounded by copper kettles, Indian headdresses, tomahawks, pottery, polished agates, wood carvings, and related trivia. About 60 years old, jolly, and a little on the plumpish side, he was fired with a terrific enthusiasm for life. Early Utah lore, prehistoric Indian dwellings, caves, and buried treasure. He told me of one cave he had discovered about 40 miles from Rockville, and showed me the scads of material he had taken from it, including yucca fiber, sandals, cloth, and rope. He said museum experts had pronounced it basket maker material between 1,000 and 2,000 years old. He described the cave as being entered through a small passage which opened into a room about 40 feet wide and 100 feet long. Here debris had accumulated to a great depth, and the dust was so bad it was necessary to wear a respirator when working. He said he'd take me to the cave if I'd stay over another day. He also told me about the cave of the Golden Jesus. The story behind this second cave, cave said Albert, had its beginning in about 1810 when Mexico declared her independence from Spain. Realizing their cause was lost, a group of Spanish soldiers deserted, and as they were fleeing the country, paused long enough to ransack a Mexican church of its gold and silver vessels and money. They also pried from the altar cross, altar cross a figure of the crucified Jesus about three feet in height and made of solid gold. Having pillaged the church of some 40 borough loads of loot, the soldiers made their way north through what is now Arizona. With the land becoming drier and rougher as they traveled, and with wild game almost non-existent, the men found it necessary to kill and eat their burrows. When too few animals remained to carry the loot, the deserting soldiers began burying less valuable pieces. More valuable pieces followed, and the last to be buried was a golden corpus. According to Albert, this was cached in a cave on the 50-mile mountain between Boulder and Escalante, Utah. While admitting that much of the story is legendary, Albert said there is considerable evidence to substantiate it. He said that, all, he said that the bodies of all but three of the soldiers were eventually found, one having made his way as far north as British Columbia before cashing in his chips. 
and that pieces of 18th century armor and other Spanish mementos had been found along that presumed route of escape. Albert still hadn't found this cave of the Golden Jesus, but he knew a man who claimed to have a hot clue to its location. Soon he would sell his curio store and be foot loose again. He and this other fellow were going to try to run it down. After we had talked for about three hours of caves and Indian burials and golden treasure hoards, Albert Hubert settled down to business and told me the history of Rockville. From what he had been able to learn through old, re old records and old timers, the first to establish homes at the present town site were John Langston and William Crawford. William Crawford was my great-great-grandfather who homesteaded right where the mouth of Zion's National Park sits today, right where the visitor center sits today, was William Crawford's um, homestead. Anyway, from some of those references we find some of the things that Llewellyn Harris mentioned in his story. Now I want to separate what I know to be fact from things that are obviously fiction. First of all, we know from history and from Llewellyn Harris's own account and from church history, from the church archives, that Llewellyn Harris went on many missions to the Indians. We know that he performed a great miracle among the Zuni Indians. And as a result, he was given a treasure map that was supposed to be the location of a Spanish treasure. How the Zunis ended up with this map, I have no idea. But I do know that that is a f historical fact. They have family, he has historical family journals that relatives in the family have to this day that tell about Llewellyn Harris receiving this map and sewing it on the inside of his coat. I met a granddaughter of Llewellyn Harris who claimed to have a copy of the map, but to this date she has never been able to find it or has been unwilling to show it to me. We do know that Llewellyn Harris, shortly after his mission to the Zunis, moved to Escalante and brought a herd of cattle and went directly to the Caparowitz Plateau and began running cattle on that high mountain plateau. His name subsequently is written, scratched, in four areas that I know about. One down along the Colorado River off the east end of the plateau. His name is in the Harris Wash area on a sandstone ledge. Harris Wash is named after Llewellyn Harris. His name is etched in Window Wind Arch, which is on the is on the north edge of the plateau, about four miles from the east east end. His name is also out on the area near Spencer's Point in a cave. We also know that Llewellyn Harris has some family, an extensive family history and many writings that he has given to his descendants down through the, down through the years. About two years ago, a friend of mine, Dan Lowe, gave me a phone call and sent me a photograph of a map that he had been that he had come in contact with. He, he asked me if I knew what this map might be and he said that this map was a black slate map found by Jacob Hamlin a few miles south of Kanab. And this map was on, on an unusual piece of rock for that area. Black slate is not very common in that area. And he said it was found upside down and when he turned it over there was this map was on it. When I saw the map 
my first thought, my immediate thought was that that was probably the same map that Llewellyn Harris had sewn on the inside of his jacket. And I suspect that this was another a map that was left on the rock by the Spanish in case they lost the other map that was on the buckskin that they had, that they had made, that ended up in the hands of the Zuni Indians. This I have not been able to confirm. It's, this is just a suspicion. The interesting thing about this map is that it is a, it shows three constellations on the map. It's actually kind of a star map. It looks a little bit obscure and it is unless you have some of the backstory. Without actually having the, the exact date on a calendar that this map correlates to, it would be impossible to know the location that is shown on this map. because the constellations are moving and the earth is moving and these constellations are in different locations at different times of the year. So without that key, a specific date when this map was made, this map wouldn't mean anything to anybody unless they have the backstory that I have and already have information about the general location. And because of that, when I looked at this map, I knew exactly where it was describing. I also knew that I had been to the very location that this map talks about. Because of that, I suspect that Llewellyn Harris did indeed find the treasure, the lost treasure of the, old, the Golden Jesus, and I suspect that he either moved it or took it somewhere else in a better, safer area for better, safer keeping. The reason that I suspect that is because we know from history that the Indians did indeed trade during, during hard times, they did indeed trade with silver coins and different Spanish implements because the pioneers in Canab talk about some of the things that these Indians traded for food during hard times. My grandma Hall um, was raised in Kanab, Utah as a little girl and she knew many of these Indian people that would come into town and during different times of the year during the winter time they would come to Kanab in the summer months they would go to Escalante and they occasionally would trade for food with Spanish treasure and that is a known fact and so that, again, substantiates the story of the Golden Jesus. Now I wrote, as I read this George A. Thompson article, I wrote a letter to Mr. Thompson, um, February 1st, 1992. In return, I received this letter the 21st of February 1992 from Mr. Thompson. He said, Richard Crawford Jr., thank you for your letter regarding the so-called Golden Jesus. As stated in my old Spanish trail, the story is only a legend, but as you are aware, most legends are based at least in part on facts. I have collected and written about many such legends in more than a hundred magazine articles and in several books. And while the Golden Jesus is not one I would spend much time in pursuing, nevertheless, where there is smoke, there is fire. The story is too well known not to have some substance. Since writing Old Spanish Trail, I have published two other books and do not have immediate access to notes and references pertaining to that work. As I recall, the reference to Bishop Harris is in one of the LDS church histories of southern Utah possibly in one of the volumes of the life and times of Joseph Fish. I have a large treasure book library and have noted references to the Golden Jesus in many treasure books. Also, many other authors have written accounts of the treasure, several of which I have on hand and which I have Xeroxed for you. 
I wrote an article for Treasure for True Treasure magazine in August 1969 issue. But it tells little not already mentioned in Old Spanish Trail. Note that some accounts place the treasure cave in the Henry Mountains instead of on the 50 Mile Mountain. I suspect that those writers have confused the Golden Jesus with the lost Josephine mine of the Henrys. I would give the quote from Murbarger village in Zion's shadow some credence, credence, for I doubt she would mention it if she didn't think the story had some merit. The long article by Kildare is of interest since he spent his life in the southern Utah, northern Arizona area and knew most of the characters mentioned. I have hiked quite a bit on the Henry Mountains as well as in the canyons of the Escalante, so I know it is a rough place to find one small cave. With other treasures and lost mines easier to find, I wouldn't spend much time searching for the Golden Jesus. Still, I wish you success in your search. If you find anything, let me know, and if you should come across any old Spanish signs cut into old trees into rocky ledges, please take photos and send me a copy. Thanks for your interest and good luck. George A. Thompson, Utah Research History, Leighton, Utah. It wasn't long after that that George Thompson passed. George Thompson and his mother passed away in an automobile accident, and so I was not able to continue my correspondence with him. Now I want to talk about some of the things that I know are factual. I know there was an old mine, an old Spanish mine, over around the Virgin River area. We have a cache site that is associated with that area from the inscriptions, probably Jesuit, inscribed on the rocks, we feel fairly certain that there is an old cache site there, probably from an old mine. This puts a silver mine in that area about the same time as the Golden Jesus legend started. We have the Indian account to the early Mormon pioneers that they had had a running fight with the Spanish. Subsequently there is a canyon near the Crossing of the Fathers which is called Surprise Canyon. Legend has it that that was where the Indians surprised the Spanish as they were attempting to cross down and hit the canyon that would take them to the Crossing of the Fathers. This canyon is just prior to the downgrade that will take them to the Crossing of the Fathers. On the bench above there, on Grand Bench, is where the burrow bones and the pack saddles were found. So we do have evidence that the Spanish were in that area. We have the historical name of the canyon, Surprise Canyon. We have burrow bones and Spanish pack saddles near the Crossing of the Fathers. I believe that if you're going to find burrow bones and pack saddles, you're not the treasure or whatever was on those burrows is not going to be too far away. Um, not far from the mesa, the shimmering waters of Lake Powell now cover the old Spanish crossing, the crossing of the fathers. When the Mormon pioneers settled in the Hurricane Valley area, it wasn't long before a miner discovered silver ore in sandstone. This is a geological mystery that hadn't been had not been had not happened before. And up until this time, geologists had said that silver could not be in sandstone. When uh, sandstone when this area was explored more thoroughly, it was found that there were large petrified logs that had entirely turned to silver. Some of these were 40 feet long. It would have been a wonder of the world if they had not crushed these up for, for silver ore. It is my belief that the Spanish exploited this very same deposit of silver. They probably hydrated the, ease, more, the more easily accessed silver deposits that were on the surface 
as well as some of these geological features like petrified wood and sandstone um, geodes that contain high amounts of silver. Um, I've done a lot of research looking for a mission or a mine around the hurricane area. While I have several leads, I have still not yet been able to verify an actual mission or a mine location. In putting this together, I do believe that there is a Spanish treasure that was hidden by the Spanish as they attempted to make their way back to Old Mexico. I do believe that the Indians that that the Indians attacked them and forced them to miss their crossing, miss the canyon that they needed to take to get across the crossing. I think they were pushed up onto the higher plateau where some of their burrow bones and pack saddles were later found. I believe they also cached the cross and the bullion or other treasure items that they had from this mission somewhere in that general vicinity. Whether or not they carried it up higher onto the Kaparowitz Plateau or not seems to be a pretty far-fetched idea considering how rugged and difficult it would be to get burrows up on the back side of the Kaparowitz Plateau. There is an old trail that will take you up there, but it is very, very rugged, very steep, and it was an old Indian trail. I don't think the Spanish would have known about that trail. They would have had to have found it accidentally while they were being pursued. And for them to hide the treasure in that area, to me, seems quite remote. However, we do have the map that was found by Jacob Hamlin on the black silver slate not far outside of Canal, which is not very far from this area. We also have the map that Llewellyn Harris had sewn on the back side of his, inside of his jacket. If I could ever get a copy of that map and verify, it's probably the same or very similar to this map that was on the piece of slate. I believe this map was, a, was left by the Spanish in the event that they lost their other map or somehow could not make it back that they would be able to tell an ancestor or a relative about this slate map or give them the map that they had that the Zunis ended up with so that they could find their way back to this treasure. Now after 40 years of research into this I have put together a lot of information and I have a lot more history that goes with Llewellyn Harris and the Spanish but until I am able to take this a little bit further as far as finding a mission near the hurricane area or doing some more research upon the Caparowitz Plateau or that Grand Bench this my research has kind of come to a standstill the old road up onto Grand Bench is completely washed out and it's accessed now only by a seven mile hike. The trail that used to be a good horse trail up onto the 50 mile mountain is now completely washed out as well as the road that takes you up onto the bench. And so now that trail has become a 14 mile mule or horseback trip to get up onto the 50 mile mountain. Subsequently all of these areas are in either Glen, Glen Canyon Recreation Area or the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, which makes both of these areas off limits to any type of treasure hunting and effectively seals this area off for further exploration. But this is my information and knowledge about the story of the Golden Jesus and about Llewellyn Harris. I hope you've enjoyed my research. Thank you. <music>